For those of you that don't know the Sports Institute, or maybe you're new, this is your first event with us, um, we work to expand participation and safety in sports. And so what that means to us is we're trying to get more people moving through sports, exercise, recreation, play. And we also wanna keep those activities as safe as possible while you do them. And so that's why today we're gonna to talk about how to stay active during a pandemic. Um, and I do wanna introduce our speakers real quick because they're very humble and they won't do it themselves. Um, but we've got two amazing clinicians with us, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Chrisman. Um, Dr. Lynn is our director of clinical innovation. She's practicing sports med physician. She practices out of the Husky Stadium Eastside Clinic. She's super passionate about exercise promotion, sports injury prevention. Um, let's see, she's an avid horseback rider, swimmer, hiker, just total treat of a human. So I know you're gonna love to hear from her. And Dr. Chrisman, also a treat. Um, and she's our director of community outreach. And so she is a pediatrician. Um, she is also really good at Ultimate Frisbee. So if that's one of your questions, she might be able to give you some tips. Um, but we're just so lucky to have them today. And so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Cindy, Dr. Lynn, to talk to us about how physical activity can really play a role during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks so much, Sarah, for the introduction. And thank you everybody for joining us today for this webinar. Um, so I'm going to focus on physical activity in adults first before I pass it off to Dr. Chrisman, who's going to talk about physical activity in youth. And so physical activity is beneficial for physical, mental, emotional health. And at the Sports Institute, we're committed to building this positive cycle of physical activity in our communities. Um, because as we know, physical activity has tremendous benefits. It can improve brain structure and function in youth. Um, it could, um, physical activity is so important to our healthcare systems in improving cost savings because of the important role that it plays in preventing diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity. Um, it's also been associated with a reduced risk of 13 types of common cancers. Um, it's important in improving our mood, attention, focus, and memory. And it's also been important in the school setting for um, improving academic achievement. However, at the same time, while we know all the great benefits of activity, um, unfortunately, widespread physical inactivity is a serious problem. Um, a lot of us do jobs where we're increasingly sedentary, and I'm sure with the COVID pandemic, teleworking from home, you may be sitting even more than before. And in fact, even before the pandemic, 80% of US adults didn't meet the national guidelines for physical activity. Um, as I mentioned, this has tremendous um, cost to our healthcare system. And on top of that, with the pandemic um, and the restricted mobility that a lot of people have, they're not getting out of their house as much, it's also really affected people's mental health as well. So the WHO, again, this is all information just sort of setting the stage prior to COVID. Um, physical inactivity was already caused, called the fourth leading risk factor for death worldwide. And it was already called an urgent public health priority. So ranking right up there with high blood pressure, um, tobacco use, high blood sugar seen in diabetes, physical inactivity is one of the major leading causes of death worldwide. So what are these national guidelines that I referenced before that 80% of Americans can't meet? So it recommends that adults do about 100, at least 150 minutes a week total of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes a week of vigorous, like high intensity exercise. And the more recent activity guidelines in 2018, it, it struck this more inclusive tone, just telling people, hey, just move more, try to sit less. It's okay if you don't meet the, meet the 150 minutes a week. You know, something's better than nothing. And for youth, um, which Sarah's going to talk about in detail, youth are recommended to have at least 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So as mentioned, unfortunately, um, we are as a nation missing the mark um, in terms of activity. So there's significant variations depending on what state you live in, in terms of the number of adults who report doing no physical activity other than their regular job. And you can see geographic variations in that. And 
where, where we are right now in Seattle. So Washington state is actually ranks, ranked as one of the healthiest states with only 19% of people being physically inactive. But still there's so much more that we need to do um, ourselves and in our own communities to help improve activity levels. And some of that starts with also understanding that in addition to being active, we need to figure out ways of breaking up and um, or sitting time. So on average, if you can believe it, Americans sit about six to eight hours per day. Um, and studies have shown that if you sit for more than six hours a day, it can be associated with a 19% higher death rate from all causes compared to sitting less than three hours a day. So I, I hope that's a good cue for the stretch break that Sarah just mentioned earlier. And um, if, if you watch TV a lot during those prolonged sitting hours, that's actually been associated with an increased risk of death, regardless of what activity you're doing. And that's been believed to be maybe related to snacking or other factors of what we're doing when we're watching TV for long hours a day. So there is some good news to that in that if you are actually sitting a lot during the day, so let's say you work an office job like a lot of us do, sort of eight to five sitting in front of a computer, that if you can do exercise at least 60 minutes a day, that can offset um, that negative toll on your health. Um, but I realize that's really hard to achieve for a lot of people who are busy, um, you know, I'm managing young children, work, and a lot of other responsibilities that have actually just increased during COVID. And it's always been reassuring to me that the literature shows that even if you can get up, you can break up that sitting time five to 10 minutes a day um, between, you know, an hour of sitting, a half hour of sitting, it still has important health benefits. So, well, that was sort of setting the stage for where we are even before the pandemic. Well, what happened when the pandemic hit in terms of physical activity? So this is where we stand right now. Um, so worldwide, there's been over 4 million cases of COVID. Uh, sorry, actually not worldwide. This is in the US. Over 4 million cases of COVID with over 150,000 deaths to date. And that exercise patterns during COVID has been impacted. So most Americans in this Gallup poll reported that they actually decreased their activity level or did not change it um, since about March. And this is another study where they actually looked worldwide using a free app called Azumo that looks at step count on iPhones. And within about 10 days of the pandemic being declared in different countries, there were already decreases in step count. And this graph basically just shows different countries from Brazil to France to Italy, Japan, and when they locked down and you could see there was a really big decrease or um, sharp decrease in step count as people sheltered in place and stayed at home. And so with that in mind, it's so important to still remember the physical activity saves lives. It can reduce the severity of mental health symptoms. Um, during COVID in, in particular, it's, it's been really important in reducing severity of lung infections, which is one of the major concerns of COVID infection, is um, the potential complication of pneumonia or other um, lung-related complications. It's important in boosting the immune system, it strengthens our heart fitness, and it decreases the risk of um, some of these other risk factors like diabetes and obesity, which have been seen more co commonly in people who've required hospitalization for COVID. So why is exercise so important for the immune system? Well, there's been great research done over many years that has shown that regular physical activity actually strengthens our immune system. It's like exercise for immune system. It helps from youth to adulthood and the elder years, and it can help reduce inflammation in our body. And keeping our immune system strong, and one of the ways of doing that, obviously, is exercise, good sleep, good nutrition, all of these things decreasing our stress level, is so important in our body's defense against infections. Physical activity also boosts our mood. Um, reg regular physical activity um, helps to decrease stress, anxiety levels, it can improve our sleep, and it's been shown to be as effective as some antidepressant medications in reducing the symptoms of mild to moderate depression. So you probably have a lot of questions on your mind and we will have a Q&A at the end um, about, well, how can I stay active during this pandemic? You know, there's so much information in the news. We don't really know what to process and what we can or can't do. Um, Exercises Medicine, um, which is on this website, does have some helpful 
tips on there. And so let's say you're staying at home, um, you know, you're with your family, but you're not infected, should you be limiting your activity? And at this time, there's no recommendations to limit your activity if you don't have any symptoms or any confirmed COVID. If, for instance, you have a confirmed case of COVID infection and you're quarantining and isolating at home, you know, one of the common questions that we get um, is, well, what should I do now about my activity? I was a regular runner. Should I keep running or should I keep, um, you know, exercising at home on my treadmill? So the, the guideline right now is that if you have a COVID infection, um, but you don't have any symptoms at all, you can continue doing sort of like light to moderate intensity exercise, meaning, you know, brisk walk or nothing greater than what you're already doing at baseline as tolerated, obviously making sure that you're not exposing anybody else. Um, but if you develop any symptoms such as difficulty breathing or cough that you should really be stopping exercise and talking to your physician. So we really want to be here, the Sports Institute, as a resource to the community. Um, and we have some excellent resources on our website. That includes the Exercise Anywhere, which is um, free online exercise videos and some you know, images of exercises that you can do from your own home office or from your living room. We have Exercise Rx, which is, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that resource, but it'll help you find some free low cost exercise options right in your own neighborhood by zip code. We have some great tips for working from home, how you can stay active during the day with small movement breaks, and also a pretty extensive learning center that talks more in depth about some of these topics about activity during COVID. So here's an example of how to exercise while working from home. Um, and so this is actually a picture of the exercise bike I have at home. I'm, I'm not sitting on it right now, just, um, but I'll get on it later today. And um, can actually prop up your laptop and try to do your video conferencing while you're getting a few pedal, pedaling um, breaks in. Um, other ways of getting steps in during the day obviously would be trying to sit on a yoga ball just so you get a little bit more strengthening exercise, trying to stand while you're using your laptop on a counter. So it takes some creativity, um, which a lot of these small breaks do, but it, it is possible to find ways to build more standing and movement throughout the day. This is the resource I mentioned, which is excellent on our website. It has over 800 resources spanning 104 zip codes in the greater Seattle area of free and low cost accessible exercise options. This is our Exercise Anywhere resource too, where we've curated a list of um, free and accessible options from youth to um, people with um, disabilities, elderly, about you know, different kinds of exercises that you can do from home. And this is one of the really exciting projects that I'm working on with the Sports Institute in collaboration with Computer Science and Engineering, which is that we're co-developing an app um, that will actually help people who really need to move the most. So people who really don't have access to a gym or a Peloton or a fitness trainer, you know, the average person who kind of struggles to find a way to build movement throughout their busy life. And that this app will actually help support them in building in step count and some really simple home exercise breaks, five, 10 minutes at a time to help them on their um, fitness and health journey. And with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Sarah Christman to talk more about physical activity and youth. Thanks, Dr. Lynn. Um, so uh, just to sort of shift gears now, we're going to talk about physical activity in kids and, and sort of what are the different things that we focus on, what are the things that we want to think about in kids. And as uh, Sarah Moseman said at the start, I'm a pediatrician and also an adolescent medicine specialist, so this is near and dear to my heart. So physical activity, when we think about physical activity in kids, we we sort of shift our frame a little bit. It doesn't mean necessarily going to the gym. It doesn't need to mean going on a run. With kids, especially younger kids, if you give them access to movement, they will move and all movement is physical activity. Um, and so this is the WHO definition of physical activity, which is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. Um, and, you know, I, I have an eight-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter and they, you know, we put trampolines in front of the TVs and they're going to move. And so this is the frame, you know, where 
we don't want, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so as a parent, I think we're all struggling of all the different responsibilities we now have um, and thinking about movement in a more creative way. That's really our goal today. So when we think about physical activity in kids, we have sort of different um, categories that we break it up into. And this is, I think, a helpful way to sort of organize our thinking about this. And so, um, you know, traditionally we think of PE or gym class and, and this, you know, ages ago was more of, you know, playing soccer or climbing the rope or sort of these old school things. PE has shifted today and, and is, is much more creative. There's yoga, there's obstacle courses. Um, organized sports have always been a part of physical activity for kids. Um, I think they bring a lot of benefits. It's not for everybody, but it's a great way for kids to get outside, to be around other kids. Um, active play, so you see here kids, you know, playing at the park, playing with water, those kinds of things really are a huge um, way that kids move their bodies around. Um, and active transport is an area that's been uh, increasing focus in the past maybe 10 years as a way of trying to encourage kids to, to move their bodies, which is that it used to be kids would always bike to school, walk to school. Now there has to be a little bit more effort. You know, kids are more living in the suburbs are having to cross streets. And so this is the sort of, you know, the, the biking school bus, the walking school bus that I think most people are familiar with. So why do we care about physical activity in kids? Well, it's for a lot of the same reasons we care about in, the, in adults. But I, I think there's also this piece of we, we want kids to start to think of themselves as a, as a physically active person. Like the, the habits you create as a kid are those habits that you bring into adulthood. And so clearly there's a big piece of trying to prevent um, those disorders, those diseases that are associated with sedentary behavior, so obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, but there's also just that, um, you know, creating cardiovascular fitness, which is a, a long word for the strength of your heart. So your heart is a muscle, and the more that you move around, the more that that blood is pumping through your body and the stronger your heart gets. And when you have that kind of heart fitness, that affects your whole body, that affects your brain, that affects your mood, that affects like how everything works. And so with kids, the physical activity can, can affect mental health, can affect academic performance, performance um, and, and really their whole kind of wellness. Um, in Seattle, vitamin D is also essential. You get vitamin D by being outside and being in sunlight. And we have very limited sunlight here, both because the days are short and because uh, of our winters. Um, and so that getting outside and being physically active can be a way of boosting that as well. So, you know, Dr. Lynn talked a little bit about physical activity requirements and, and physical activity requirements of kids are pretty high. So the recommendations are 60 minutes of what we call moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is a mouthful. So we will usually say MVPA. And what that means is that um, it's sort of like fast walking is about MVPA. So that when you're, when you're really doing vigorous physical activity, it's hard to talk. When you're doing moderate to vigorous physical activity, you can talk, but you can't sing is sort of the definition of that. Um, and only 30% of US boys and 20% of US girls achieve this goal. And you see this map of the globe and it's not much better across, across the world. This is, it's challenging to get kids active these days. And this is also to show you that this is an area that we particularly focus on is that kids tend to be very active when they're younger and then that falls off as they go into adolescence and adulthood. And this is an area that we really try to think about how can we support kids to stay active. So there was a study a, a long time ago where they had toddlers and uh, Olympic athletes were following the toddlers around trying to do every movement that they did. And by the end of the day, they were just completely exhausted. You know, two year olds do not stop moving. Um, but as we get kids older and older, they have different interests that create more sedentary behavior and so we need to find that balance. So how has physical activity changed for kids during COVID? Well this is a little bit different than adults but I, I think the big thing that has changed is a lot of the areas you know this is sort of the areas that I talked about before in ways that kids were getting physical activity and at, with the loss of school with kids staying at home more we've lost a lot of those so about 53 percent of kids were getting PE at least once a week that's now gone with COVID. 54% were playing at least one sport. We don't have sports right now. Active play, a lot of that relied on playgrounds and pools and other public spaces, and those have not been open. Um, and then active transport, 
So kids that were walking or biking to school, that's gone. You know, people who wear a Fitbit know that just leaving the house increases your steps. And so these kids are not even getting, even if they're walking to the car and walking from the car to the school, that's also gone. So this just shows you during COVID, we've had this huge loss of physical activity. Um, next slide. So this is, there's been a few studies, and this is actually kind of combining a couple of studies. Uh, the literature has kind of blossomed around COVID, but it's still, this data is still being collated. So these are fairly small studies. The purple bar is Spain and Italy. So you see, they, it was not great. Physical activity was not great before COVID and it's fallen off even more. And so they were about 50% of kids meeting these you know, recommendations around physical activity and it's dropped to less than 20%. The gray bars are from a Canadian study and it, there you can see the younger kids were doing better. So that's the, the darker gray bar and they were you know, almost at 50%. That's dropped to less than 10%. And the older kids, the teenagers have, now almost like less than 1%. So these are really concerning that we're seeing even in this short period of time, these big drop-offs in physical activity. And this is to remind you that we not only have this loss of physical activity, we also have an increased sedentary time. So now we've taken these kids um, and kids that were doing online school, kids that whose parents are working and so that they're having more screen time. And so this was a, a small Italian study. They found that on average, kids were getting three hours a day before COVID. And then with COVID, it's increased to eight hours a day. Um, and as Dr. Lin mentioned, with this sedentary behavior, um, that, that has its own risks. Like we think about those sort of two competing things that you wanna work on, increasing physical activity and decreasing sedentary behavior. The same study looked at sports time and in the, that group of Italian kids they were getting three and a half hours per day before COVID and that had dropped to one and a half hours per day. So what are some protective factors? Well this one Canadian study that had looked at uh, physical activity during COVID found um, some encouraging data that you know parents who were more engaged, who were supportive, those kids had uh, more retention of their physical activity behavior. Um, dog ownership, so this is sort of a, something to get you out of the house. You know, I think uh, that it's, it's hard when you have all of these other pressures pushing on you that you may not um, push yourself to get out of the house, but dog ownership has been a piece of that. So what can we do to encourage physical activity in our kids? Well, you know, as I said, we all have a lot of pressures on us, but I think the most important thing really is modeling. So you matter too, your wellness matters, making movement a priority for you, making opportunities for the whole family. Um, this can be something as simple as like, let's walk to the park. Um, you know, you, it, it doesn't need to be a, a big, a big outing, it can be something small. Um, certainly for kids, always making it fun. So, you know, I find with my kids, if I say like, let's go on a hike, there's a little bit of the, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to do that. But then if it's like, let's go on a scavenger hunt, or let's do geocaching, or, you know, you know, trying to think of ways that there are going to be more bought into that. Um, environment certainly matters so that, you know, with the loss of playgrounds, you, you can see around Seattle, a lot of parents have really pushed on this area and that you see popping up their playgrounds in their front yard and there's trampolines and there's obstacle courses and this doesn't have to be expensive or fancy. You can see here there's an obstacle course that they just made out of things around their house. Um, but making that kind of space for kids to be active is, is really important. Um, the social piece, and this is a huge challenge for parents right now, and I'm in the same, the same boat, but as much as you can find some ways to be socially distanced and physically active with friends, that's a huge motivator for kids. Um, so biking has been a really effective way where you're already kind of a distance away, but you have that friend there to kind of support you. Um, and then kids really respond to goals and that kind of gamifying thing. So that can be races, that can be those sort of step counting, uh, anything that kind of makes it a little bit more... Um, like a rewarding for them. So this is just sort of thinking through some other ways to stay active. You know, the playgrounds are closed, but the trees are open. You can still climb trees. Um, you can bring a Frisbee. You might not be able to play soccer, but you can go to the park and kick into the soccer goal. Um, certainly water sports and stand up paddle boards, kayaks. That's another way that people have found to like be outside, but in a safe way. 
And then indoors, you know, we, we have a lot of rain, so we have to think more about how do we also stay active indoors. Um, you know, it can be a five minute dance party. Like as Dr. Lin said, all movement counts any, any amount of time that you can do this. You can set up an obstacle course in your house. The floor is lava. Uh, there are some exercise videos, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more, um, because as the Sports Institute, we've been really trying to collate this area, and we recognize that it's really hard for parents right now, and how can we kind of support parents to find ways to be physically active. So I'll talk through that a little bit. So this is sort of talking through some of the resources that we have as a sports institute to support um, parents around keeping kids active. So Exercise Anywhere also has a youth filter. And this is an area that we're continually updating and trying to find resources. If you have a resource you love, we want to hear about it. Um, Go Noodle, this is actually um, a, a website and they have a YouTube videos that has been really great with my kids. There, a lot of them are really short um, and they're just ways to keep moving. And that this is actually something my, my, my uh, second graders teacher was using as a way of taking breaks to kind of keep kids active. Um, the Daily Mile is a, something really close to our heart and that we've been really engaged in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple screens, but that's just get, taking a break to have a little run throughout the day. Um, and Cosmic Kids Yoga, this is also on the Exercise Anywhere site, but this is a, there's some yoga for kids that's really designed for them that is like story-based and more interesting and engaging. So as I said, Exercise Anywhere is not just for adults and we're really trying to build this out. We want to try to make this useful for parents. Um, you can see we have Upower on here, which is another resource that has some play kits for families. Um, we have the Daily Mile. We have the other ones that I talked about, the Go Noodle, Cosmic Kids Yoga. This is a, a place that you can find all of those resources. And you can also find your resources so you kind of have those both pieces built in. So the Daily Mile, as I talked about, this is an area we've been really engaged in. This is um, a, a project that was really started in Scotland and is this idea of kind of creating a new way of kids to be physically active. So I talked about those different categories. The, di the Daily Mile adds a whole other way for kids to be active, which is the teachers in school would just take a 10 to 15 minutes at some point during the day and take the kids and run around the block. And it's not PE, it's not recess, it's a completely new additional way of being active. Um, and part of the idea of like, this is a way that you take care of your body, you give yourself a break so that you can then get back and really engage in school. Um, and we've been really excited about this. The teachers that we've been partnering with have been really excited. And when everything went to um, online school, we've then uh, creatively tried to think about how can we keep this alive and how can we make this a resource for parents as they're trying to, you know, to manage online school. And so we created the Daily Mile at home and you can go to the website and there's a lot of resources about how to, wait, how to make this engaging and fun for kids and today's Wear Blue Day and, you know, how can they, how can they do this in a way that's, uh, that's inspiring for them. So in conclusion, physical activity is incredibly important for improving your health, for building resilience. And during the pandemic, these are just a, a huge area of focus for us. And you know, we lead the way, you lead the way by supporting yourselves, your families, and your communities to stay active. And all movement counts, even five minutes, even walking around the block. Um, we, we can get through this together. Awesome. Thank you both. That was so good. I wrote down a handful of things that I learned from this. I mean, the, the main thing seems to be getting creative. You know, every, when you say every movement counts, sometimes I think there are activities that we don't think are physical and can benefit our health, but they actually are. Um, one of which I need to follow my nieces and nephews around to get a really good workout, apparently. Um, <laughs> I'm going to definitely be integrating that into my day. Um, so I want to get to some questions. We had a few come through. Um, and then we can hopefully give you some of your time back on, on this Tuesday, but maybe that's a good place to start is what are, what are some activities? And I'd love to hear from both of you that maybe are normally not seen as typical exercise, but really could count towards that, you know, 60 minutes a week or 75 minutes a, a week. Thanks so much. That's a really great question. Um, I mean, there's this whole concept now of fitness snacks. And, and the idea is that even if you do small bursts of like just, 
you know, for somebody who doesn't run up their stairs often, maybe run up the stairs or try to, you know, even activities which are like cleaning your house can or doing yard work, those count as activity as well. Um, because that, you know, that can all count towards the amount. Sarah, anything to add on that? No, I agree with Dr. Lynn. I think, you know, I, I, you know, used to have a Fitbit. I now have an Apple watch and I definitely notice that on days that I'm sitting less and just moving around the house, even if it's doing laundry, other things like you actually get more physical activity. But I, I do think really valuing that and finding a way that it's positive for you, that it's a fun little break for you makes a big difference. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to add chopping wood to my list for sure. Um, Another question, I think it's more broadly, um, you know, we all are part of families and, and there's a lot of question about what's safe and what's not safe. So just, you know, kind of generally to hear from you, what are some ways we can safely stay active as a family um, as it relates to COVID right now? Well, I'll say that the certainly the data has shown that being outdoors is, is much safer than being indoors. Um, and that uh, ideally we're, you know, being either is socially distanced from people at least six feet away or wearing a mask um, and, and, you know, trying to, you know, adhere to all of those. I think there's still a lot of questions too in terms of, you know, um, uh, how, do, how do we do this? How do we make a balance? And so going, you know, still fine to go to parks, maybe bringing a mask for when you're going down to places that you're closer to people. Uh, I, I, I think that there are people that are really exploring this and trying to do this in a smart way. And that um, I think that's what we're going to have to continue to do. Cindy? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us are, you know, just struggling to try to find ways to be more active in our lives and also with our kids. And, and I think it's so important for the youth, especially during the pandemic, because we know that sort of building these lifelong habits to be active as youth is so important for them to maintain that as adults. And so I think, you know, if you're fortunate to live in a community where you can go outside and take a walk and it's safe, um, you know, that's great, because then you can do that as a family unit and socially distance um, as best you can from other um, individuals. If, if you live in an environment where you just can't get out of the house, you know, people live in urban areas, maybe it is just finding music. Like sometimes my kids and I, it's a rainy day, we just find a video on YouTube um, and then we just dance to it together. So that's something that everybody can do, which is find some kind of music they like and take a movement break. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add is that one thing might work one day and it won't work the next day and you just have to flow with that. And so like my kids, like I you know, I can't convince them to go to the park one day and then the next day I find some thing that then makes them excited and you just have to kind of, every day is a new day. Yeah, and I think, you know, with you both being parents, I think it's just, it's helpful to hear some of your challenges, you know, because I think we obviously really want to stay positive and get creative, but sometimes it's just hard. And so I'd love to hear from both of you on maybe some of the challenges that you face with your own kids, um, maybe some solutions that you've gotten through those or really just to commiserate on <laughs> some of the challenges we're going through um, in trying to keep our kids active and then also ourselves, right? Because we got to put our own oxygen mask on first, right, in order to lead the way for our kids. So we'd love to hear from you on that. Well, I definitely, you know, as I said, I'm deep in the midst of this because my kids are eight and 10 and that really trying to think about ways to keep them active and ways uh, to keep them engaged and we've just tried to run the gamut of that so we've you know done some camping we've done you know we've done some stand-up paddleboard we go to the park with the you know a, a soccer ball and kick it around uh, we try to climb trees we do sort of everything and that I, I think there are times that you feel like oh how do I you know how do I keep them engaged and you just have to keep trying that's what I found I do I do think one of the things that was helpful for us we got a very small trampoline and put it in front of the TV um, and that actually my, my kids will jump on it and they, they really like having that. So I think it, you have to sort of see what's going to work for you as a family. Um, but I also agree with Dr. Lynn, you know, you, you may not have those resources and that that's, it, it's okay. Like you may not have a park nearby. Um, you can find something else that you can do. You can put on just music and dance around. You can, um, you can clean the house together. You can think about different things that, that work for you as a family. Well, Thank you both. I mean, I, 
I realize it's, it's such a complex time, not just for you, because you're both practicing clinicians, but for everyone that joined us today, um, we realize it's a, it's a tough time and we're all trying to navigate this together, but you know, definitely protecting your own emotional health and physical health seems to be what can really help in, in a time like this and during a pandemic. So just want to thank you for joining us today. Also, you know, we are a resource for you. So if you want to get involved, um, you want to support our work, if we could, you know, get some feedback from you on this event, whatever it is, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and you can see some of our contact information here. And, um, you know, we're actively doing work in this space. And so hopefully we can continue to benefit um, through such a challenging time. So again, thank you for joining us. You've got 23 minutes left um, back in your day. So hopefully you get out there, get moving, maybe use it to go for a walk. That's my suggestion. So awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Thank you, Dr. Chrisman. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.